This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make it with Squarespace. Okay, Islanders, it's time for you to give your decision. We would like to save this Islander because they are a massive part of the villa. Daddy's gotta go to work. Chris, can you help me? Oh, not like that, that hurts. Ow, ow! <laughs> James Wan is a master. I've been hard pushed to see a single film of his I haven't liked, and no matter the genre, Wan delivers thrills and fun in equal measure. <laughs> ah, that Darth Maul fucker gave me nightmares for ages, please don't do that again. On the flip side, I was never really into the Fast and Furious movies, even when I was told repeatedly that they had gone from being street racing movies to full blown action flicks. I'd tried before with entries like Fast Five and Fast and Furious 6, and whilst they were fun for the most part, I never really quite got the hype. That was until... Furious 7 hit screens in 2015. At that point, there wasn't quite a script yet. There was just a sort of loose outline. And they said to me, we're still trying to connect all the dots, but we know we want a sequence where a car falls out of the sky. And thus, James Wan's journey with the Fast and Furious franchise began. If I believed in guilty pleasures, Furious 7 would be the guiltiest of guilty pleasures. It is a non-stop delight of action, fun, and general degrees of over-the-topness. So in this video, I'll be diving deep into exactly what James Wan brought to the franchise to make it work so well. But this will also be kind of an essay of two parts, as I want to discuss how the movie paid tribute to the late Paul Walker, and how his character send off in a way that was both mature, heartwarming, and in keeping with the themes of the franchise. The tone is set by the opening scene. Rest now, little brother. Wanna sell you one last score? Oh, isn't it nice he's come to visit his brother? What the shit? The reveal that Shaw has broken into the hospital where his battered criminal brother was being held is equal parts awesome and ridiculous, and it's the perfect way to tell the audience that, oh boy, we are in for one wild ride. Take care of my brother. Anything happens to him? Come by looking for you. He actually expects the doctors and nurses to take care of his brother whilst the hospital is literally blowing up around them. And of course he puts his shades on at the end, of course. The opening really tells us James Wan's mission statement. To be as over the top as possible, to treat the drama the same way as the action. It's all about big, epic, almost operatic sequences designed to pull the audience along this ride. When talking about the tone of the film, Wan said, I really gravitate towards the early John Woo stuff that he used to do, which is crazy, over the top gunfights and action scenes, but sort of balanced out with very overwrought melodrama. And I love that. Before you get time to think, you're treated to the reintroduction of Letty and Dom at a street race. In the desert, set to the most obnoxious music ever. It's here some of that aforementioned melodrama comes in, as Juan picks up the threads left by the previous movie, with Letty unable to remember her past and her romance with Dom. I'd be lying if I said I thought anyone went to see this movie for a Vin Diesel romance subplot, but luckily Juan knows that too, which is why it's not long before we're treated to seeing The Rock beat seven shades of shit out of Jason Statham and vice versa. Literally vice versa, you know they have a contract about that. Kurt Russell turns up. Kurt Russell, in a franchise that started off about stealing VCRs, here playing a top secret government agent who doesn't even have a name. I'm Mr. Nobody. And of course, they need Dom and specifically his crew. My crew. I assumed you might say that, which is why I've taken the liberty of gathering your team. No, no, uh, of course he did. Of course he assembled them before Dom even said yes. Of, of course, that makes total sense. Would you like one? More of a corona man myself. Ah. You know what? If the product placement is coming, do it like this. It's so shameless, it's actually charming, and the movie gives no fucks. Yes, we had a deal with Corona, deal with it. Man, I'm really thirsty right now. Could really go for one of those Coronas. And that's not even the silliest line in the movie. Time to unleash the beast. Let's go back a shadow. 
Which is why when I get out, I'm gonna put a hurt on him so bad he's gonna wish his mama had kept her legs closed. Welcome to the party, Mr. Shaw. That last one you didn't even need because we literally see Shaw join the party, but all of these just help to draw out that same level of campiness evoked by the opening scene. One knows that street racers going up against global terrorism is so ridiculous that it can only warrant a great big dollop of cheese in every sequence to keep it moving along and above all else, to keep it fun. If you're sitting there watching Furious 7 seriously questioning anything, you're watching it wrong and the movie will make you feel stupid for it. So the thrust of the movie is about Mr. Nobody hiring the team to locate what is literally 1984 in a hard drive, but none of that really matters. It's just a conduit to get the gang from one cool set piece to the next. It's really about Jason Statham's Shaw hunting them down in a revenge quest as simple and focused as they come. You never should have messed with a match family. I told your brother the same thing. Jason Statham literally exists in this movie to give it an injection of evil charm and adrenaline whenever things are getting boring. Like a Han's funeral that suddenly turns into a car chase. And then whatever this is. Why did they do that? Who cares why? It's awesome. That this was gonna be a street fight? Shaw is basically like the Winter Soldier of the Fast and Furious universe, turning up out of the blue with a fuck ton of weaponry to give our leads a hard time. And I guess he turns good as the movies go on. That's also kind of Bucky-esque, no? There's also a great scene towards the end of Furious 7 where they try to capture him and he's just having some dinner, or as we Brits like to call it, a bit of tea. This scene is also responsible for giving us Kurt Russell wearing night vision shades and firing two pistols at once. I mean, come on. We even get a Kurt Russell wink. Seriously, that man is an onslaught of awesomeness. And so with the setup in place, our car enthusiasts turned anti-terrorist unit hatch a plan. This time it ain't just about being fast. What else is it about? What, what else is it about? The second act of the movie then zips around the world and we're treated to two actually pretty really well made action sequences. The first sees the gang dropping out of a plane in their cars to intercept a convoy carrying the creator of God's Eye, Ramsey. And they really did drop those cars out of a plane, capturing the chaos from 10 different angles, incorporating skydivers and helicopters to pull it all off. The results are really impressive. So in this ludicrous action scene, Dom and the gang face off against a small army and we're treated to some of the best car foo of the series. Ooh. Shaw drops in for some armor-plated dodgems with Dom, whilst Brian ends up locked up in the bus as it teases off the edge of a cliffside. It's a really nice moment of tension ripped straight out of Uncharted as Brian desperately races to the top whilst the entire vehicle dangles by a thread. As it turns out, it was the very first action beat Juan brought to the table. That is what I brought to this film. That kind of stuff was what I really wanted to do. Some of that horror, thriller suspense to an action movie. So naturally your boy Brian O'Connor manages to make it just in time. <laughs> Textbook. But the Abu Dhabi sequence I think is perhaps the high point of the series. We get to see the whole gang dressed to the nines, going undercover to wrangle a supercar from a billionaire who keeps it on one of the highest floors in a skyscraper. Of course he does. Now why in the hell would he keep his car in his penthouse? He's a billionaire, my friend. He can do whatever he wants. As with the skydiving sequence, I just love how these movies go out of their way to make sure cars are always included no matter what. We get Roman mugging trying to create distraction, Michelle Rodriguez fighting Ronda Rousey. Would you believe I knocked him out with my charm? You need that charming bitch. Sheesh, that's so bad. These parties bore me to death. Oh God, please just keep punching Michelle instead. Oh, that's better. But uh, seriously, don't hurt me for saying you're a crummy actor. Don't forget to mention Shaw turns up with an assault rifle because Shaw turns up with an assault rifle. The chaos is just a delight. And to top it all off, Vinny drives the sports car through a building. Cars don't fly! Oh, shit! You might 
might remember that this particular moment was spoiled in the trailer. But the movie still kept some surprises under wraps. Like the fact there's a second building. Vinny drives through not one skyscraper. No, that's not ridiculous enough. The motherfucker drives through two. Two! The finale is probably the weakest set piece of the movie, I'll admit. As I said, there's the whole God's Eye thing that nobody cares about. Something about a drone. I mean, who cares about drones in movies? This is... This is... This is... What? This is boring. So what makes the finale so damn good? Well, first off, Hobbs, who's unfortunately been out of action for most of the movie, sees the fight raging on outside through his TV and decides... Daddy's gotta go to work. Was it even healed? It doesn't sound healed. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dom and Shaw meet for round two, and this time it really is going to be a street fight. They're fighting with spanners, obviously, the cars, it's all got to be about cars. And is that choir music? Any other stale actioner probably starring Gerard Butler would try and shoot this in shaky cam close-up, probably with no music to make it, you know, grittier. But one here takes two geezers with spanners and turns it into a lightsaber duel. <laughs> Thief Dom Toretto beats ex-MI6 operative Deckard Shaw, of course, and... Thing about street fights? The street always wins. <laughs> what does that even mean? And he actually stumps the ground to pieces. <laughs> now I said before the whole Letty amnesia thing sucks, but it's worth it for the payoff at the end. When Letty finally does remember in an effort to bring Don back from the dead with the power of love. You know, the Trinity method. We are then treated to this. Will this do? Dom actually got married in a vest. In a vest. With the white trousers. Letty has made an effort. This is supposed to be, you know, in his own words, the love of his life. And he turns up to the wedding in a white vest. I, I, I can't take it. All that romance bullshit throughout the movie. Totally worth it for this. When I watched this in theatres, it was... As I said, a really fun ride, but there was also an air of tension in the room every time Paul Walker's Brian had a near miss with death. I think in part due to the tragic real life circumstances of his passing and the fact that we were all sat there wondering how and when the movie was going to decide to finish his story. Would they kill him off? It seemed a possibility, but by this point in the movie, the danger has passed and the heroes have saved the day. So what's the final turn for Brian O'Connor? How would James Wan and the team pull off his exit and tick off all the boxes between honouring the man, the character and the story? We were halfway into shooting the movie when it happened. We went back to the drawing board and it was a huge undertaking. It was unprecedented. There has never been a movie faced with this kind of setback before. There wasn't another director I could call and ask for advice. It would be an understatement to say that James Wan and the crew didn't have a gargantuan task ahead of them when they had to finish the rest of the movie without Paul. It was very important to all of us, from the filmmakers to Vin Diesel to the producers, to finish this movie and honour Paul's legacy. So we dug deep. I always say I have a big bag of cinematic tricks at my disposal, and I dug so deep into this one that I used up every single trick I can think of to make this movie work. That meant rotoscoping Paul's face into several scenes, and using his brothers, Caleb and Cody Walker, as stand-ins and body doubles. They had to rewrite the script to reshape the story now that they knew Paul wouldn't be coming back, which also meant repurposing a deleted scene from Fast Five. Outside of something like The Crow, this was an unprecedented problem. To lose a lead actor when only half of his scenes were shot required exceptional thinking to rejig the entire movie. Wan even admitted that there were discussions regarding scrapping the movie entirely, but thankfully they soldiered on and salvaged what they had. Which brings me to the final scene of the movie. 
We cut to the beach to see Brian reunited with his family in what are most likely either recycled shots or CGI enhanced body doubles utilising Paul's brothers. But honestly, it's done so well you can barely tell, and we remain on the perspective of all the other characters we've been following. So far, a standard ending for a fast movie, except everyone seems a little different. Close your mouth for two seconds. Just open your eyes, man. We come out of the reality of the movie, but we're also still kind of there. That's where he belongs. Home. Where he's always belonged. Everybody's performance hits the perfect balance of being full floor breaking whilst also being true to the characters that they play. You can tell everyone involved in this sequence was trying to do their absolute best to honour their colleague and friend. Even Roman, the comedy relief, steps it up here. Things are gonna be different now. You aren't going to say goodbye? <laughs> It's never goodbye. Dom leaves, driving off to an intersection, and it seems like this is the final time he and Brian will share the screen together. Hey, thought that you could leave without saying goodbye. Yeah, you can tell he's not really there, but at this point, does that matter? The walls of the movie's reality have come down just enough that this scene serves as both a goodbye for the characters, the actors, and the audience. The whole thing is set to see you again. Most of the tracks in the franchise are incredibly obnoxious in the best possible ways, but this track actually really works. Again, because there's an air of sincerity about it. The song perfectly complements the retrospective we're treated to as we see all of Paul's greatest Fast and Furious moments from his very first meeting with Dom right up to the present day. This is your car. My car? One said, the only way to finish this off is to show it from the point of view of Vin's character, of Dominic Toretto. By allowing us to look through his point of view, that allows us to say goodbye to Paul. And I think he was absolutely right. James Wan has made it no secret that the filming for Furious 7 was tough. I think, for what is known as being a mindless action series, Fast and Furious here delivered one of the most seamless real-world exits for an actor hit by tragedy ever. I think if nothing else, you can look at the final scene and be impressed by how the production handled it, and make no mistake, James Wan is one of the most interesting, most talented directors working today. I think we've only begun to scratch the surface with what he can do. There's so much complaining these days about comedy in movies, as we've touched on a little bit in previous essays. When something is funny, it's often criticised as being too much comedy, taking you out of the super serious movie you were watching about superheroes. But Fast and Furious isn't based on anything. There's no source material it can be accused of betraying. So instead, it just has fun with it. Each new instalment gets funnier and crazier and more ridiculous. Hobbs and Shaw looks like the kind of over-the-top buddy cop comedy we only get in 10-minute shorts on Blu-ray releases. And even then, it's meta. I know it makes me sound like an old man to say that they don't make movies like this anymore. Stick around. I'm what you might call a champagne problem. But it's true, they don't make movies like this anymore. In a time where pop culture debates rage on about inclusion and social justice and pandering and so on and so on and so on, here's a franchise that makes having a diverse cast look as effortless as it should be, and it makes no apologies for wearing its heart on its sleeve and having a hell of a lot of fun whilst doing it. If you're looking for a way to create a website as quickly as Vinny and the gang put the pedal to the metal, then you'll be extremely happy with Squarespace. Squarespace aims to give you a unique feel to your website, and once you've selected from one of the award-winning templates, there is a huge range of options to choose from when it comes to making your website distinct. It also doesn't kick up a fuss if you want to add images from your desktop or other external sources. Simply drag and drop whatever you need from your desktop into your browser window, and it'll appear on your website. 
can also upload music directly to Squarespace and easily share albums with a fantastic player that also displays album artwork. It really is that easy to get started, and if you need more of an incentive, we can get you 10% off. The details of how to do so are in the description. Just head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you've set everything up, go to squarespace.com slash fullfat to save 10% off your first purchase. And remember, stay milky. So we didn't think we'd be doing this, but um, someone has actually donated one hundred dollars, which is incredible. Yeah. Thank um, you very much, Doctor Chike. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, honestly, that's awesome. You are, as we said in our Patreon video, literally keeping the lights on. So um, no, but seriously, thank you very much. And um, yeah, yeah, we're just sort of in shock, yeah. aren't we? <laughs> Full Fat Videos is going to strange new places. Full Fat Videos just got upgraded, and along with that, we're upgrading our Patreon with new tiers and rewards just for you. Patreon could really, really help us make Full Fat Videos self-sustaining, and it'll allow us to make better videos and better content for you. For just $1 a month, you'd be helping us out a great deal already, which is why we thank you at the end of every video. Not to mention you'd get exclusive access to Full Fat Milk Posting, a Facebook group where you can talk to us about movies, TV, and games, as well as some memes. We like a bit of memes. For three dollars, you'll get access to everything from the previous tiers, but you'll also get the chance to watch our videos one day early, as well as get access to exclusive scripts and bloopers. For just five dollars a month, you'll get access to everything from all the other tiers, as well as exclusive access to ask the questions for our monthly Q&As. And that's not all. For just ten dollars, you'll get access to all of the above, as well as an exclusive commentary track picked by you. For a hundred dollars, I mean, you'd, you'd be keeping the lights on, so we'd really appreciate it, and we'd probably thank you at the end of every video on camera. You'd be really helping us in any way, shape or form if you could consider contributing to our Patreon. We love making this stuff for you guys, and we'd love to keep making more of it. So thank you, and thank you for watching. We're off to go make some more of that juicy content. We'll see you next time. Stay milky.